And a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kino Cummings. You probably know me from radio, but I'm sitting here at Life Vincent Pilotti for all the right reasons. Now, I've not become a doctor. My, my matric results didn't allow me to achieve such greatness. But I am here to facilitate what I believe is going to be a wonderful discussion, um, just looking at heart and stroke and how that pertains to you or potentially one of your family members. This whole event, of course, brought to you in partnership uh, with the Brimstone Investment Corporation, as well as the Life Group. And as I said, we are at Life Vincent Pilotti today. So without any further ado, I just want to just point out to one or two things that we probably all know, but I think we need to keep just top of mind today. And that is that we're in the midst of 16 days of activism. Um, this is just a request for all of us to, to, to speak out in our communities, where we are, especially the men out there. And then the president has also asked us to just observe five days of mourning, um, not just for gender-based violence, but for those people who have succumbed, or so have succumbed at least, uh, to, to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But I want to move on to the topic of discussion today. As I said, this is a heart and stroke discussion panel. I'm going to introduce you to the panel. They will each uh, tell you what their interest is, why they've agreed to be on this particular panel, what they'd like to get out of the panel. And I'll start with my left-hand side, your right-hand side, looking at uh, Dr. Ibrahim Kader. Thank you very much for your time. Doctor, so an introduction to yourself, who you are. I know that you are an interventional radiologist. We, saw, we were sort of debating what that is, but I'm sure you're going to tell us right now. You know, thank you very much, and thanks for having us. So thanks for having me here. So an interventional radiologist is uh, a diagnostic radiologist who's further subspecialized to do minimally invasive treatment. So we then span the diagnostic and the therapeutic side. We then form part of a multidisciplinary team where we can partner with neurologists, with uh, cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, or uh, sur uh, surgeons that deal with the rest of the body and offer therapeutic options that are minimally invasive. So it's exciting, it's new. And it's rapidly growing. So later we'll talk about things like the you know, acute ischemic strokes, etc. We'll get into that. Uh, but joining me, Mr. Sharad Naran, thank you for your time, sir. Now, I believe that just you're going to tell us your story a bit later. But if you can give us a pricey of why you here. We're obviously talking about um, you know, heart conditions and strokes. Just tell us very, very briefly why you are on the panel today. I'm here as a patient. Uh, foremost. I was admitted in hospital 2018, December. Mm -hmm. I had a bypass and then a stroke. And from there, um, I needed to be a, and that's where I'm at at the yeah. moment. Well, we, we, we're thankful that you are alive and well to tell us the story today, and hopefully, a lot of us can learn from that as well. Um, I'll skip myself. <laughs> <laughs> no one's interested in me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, moving on to Dr. Shivan Hendricks, who's a cardiologist. Talk just mm. about yourself, mm. a little bit about what you do, a little bit of cardiologists do, but, but your interest in the panel. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Kino, for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and you are great, by the way. Eh? <laughs> so, uh, just, to, just, to, just to introduce uh, the concept of interventional cardiology, uh, cardiologists deal with uh, diseases of the heart. And more specifically, interventional cardiology, we utilize practical tools to correct certain diseases. And I think um, in the mainstream, most of our viewers will be um, quite versed on the concept of a heart attack. So we intervene on blockages within the coronary arteries, to put it in layman's terms, uh, build up of atherosclerosis, which obviously can also span uh, problems uh, to do with the brain. But essentially, we use um, interventional techniques through arteries and through other vessels to get into the uh, lumen of these vessels and then um, to deploy stents. And we also do complex procedures to get rid of calcium and then to um, alleviate any obstructions and ischemia, so to speak. So uh, we deal with problems on an acute basis uh, when it comes to heart attacks and also on a more chronic basis. Yeah. We also have a lot of interest in, med in, in medicines um, to treat the heart, which we'll talk about a bit later on. What would you like to get out of the discussion today? I think um, the important uh, points uh, to um, take out of this discussion, particularly for our viewers, are to become more aware of the symptoms of um, acute heart disease, such as heart attacks and stroke. Now, I think if we, they can develop an, a concept as to what the early warning signs are, 
and then to get the message in very carefully, um, and this is what we are going to do, we're going to be quite instructive and constructive in, in getting the message out there on to get to a, a service as quickly as possible. And I know that we are in the midst of a, of a very um, a dramatic COVID epidemic, um, but obviously we also need to prioritize the other medical conditions that also of, of high importance, that also have very high mor morbidity and, and potential for mortality uh, to also uh, take precedence. So uh, hopefully we can get those messages across from a cardiovascular and a cerebrovascular perspective. It's a very important point that you make there because, you know, with COVID-19, people are scared to then come into hospitals, but it's essential, especially for chronic treatments, etc., to mm. be there, to be medicated. And if you're not there, your mortality rate mm. in general would be much higher because people mm. are too scared to get to hospitals. Absolutely. And, you know, I think our message, the key message today is hospitals take care. So when you get there, any hospital, all the necessary interventions are in place. You need to get yourself tested. You need to get yourself looked at by your doctor. But anyway, I, I leave, I'm not going to say I'm leaving the best for last, but we're going to leave the most difficult questions to Dr. Amanula Rawut. <laughs> just kidding. That was the neurologist. Doc, just a little bit of an introduction to yourself and what you hope to get out of the discussion today. So neurologist is, um, we look at all the diseases of the nervous system, including stroke. And that's my interest, stroke medicine. Yeah. And so I think the message that I think all of us want to get out there is to um, early recognition of signs of symptoms of stroke, um, like the signs and symptoms of heart attack, yes. what treatments are there, both uh, uh, intravenous treatments, interventional treatments, and we'll take it further from there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, for me, it's particularly pertinent. I've got a very good friend of mine. Uh, Chester Williams, who, who lost mm. his life uh, mm. due to uh, a heart attack. Um, my dad had something which I now know what it is, a mm. myocardial infarction. Never mm. knew anything about this stuff, and I wish that we had programs like this to actually educate Absolutely. ourselves as to what it is that we need to look out for. But I want to, once again, if you've just you've tuned in, you're wondering, I don't know how you might have happened onto this page without <laughs> purposefully getting there, but just in case you did, uh, we are talking heart and stroke. It is the dialogue. Uh, it's the panel that we're having today at Life, Vincent Pilotti. This, of course, is a partnership between the Brimstone Investment Corporation and Life Health. And it's going to be great. And I'll tell you about what's going to be happening next week. I'll be back next week. We'll be dealing with other pertinent issues. But I want to get straight into your story. Uh, Mr. Shahid Naran, um, if you can just chronologically run through what happened to you so that we can get a, a good understanding of what you went through. In 2018, I suffered um, chest palpitations and shortness of breath. And I came to see the cardiologist and he's done a couple of stents already on me. And then he said he can't do any more stents because of the way my heart is. Um, and he suggested that I have a bypass. So then I went to see Dr. Kun and he did the bypass. Um, and I was supposed to be in and out, that wasn't the case. From five days it went to about eight weeks. Um, uh, but I had complications. Um, I'm diabetic and that already masks a lot of the pains that you get. Um, like when I used to get the pains that used to hit in my wrist. And when I spoke to Dr. Tyrrell about that, he said, that's definitely your heart that's um, giving you those pains. Um, and because I thought it's weird that I get a, in my left wrist a pain, but it was always on exertion. So then I came in for the bypass, I had the bypass, um, and then a stroke happened, unfortunately. So that just kept me here longer. Um, I had to then work through, and my ankle is still not healed yet. So that's it's improved. I was in a wheelchair originally. Then you know, I'm to a walker. Those are those little frames and that. Yeah. And then I started to do uh, the park uh, physical exercises and that. And wow. that helped a lot. So at least I can walk, drive, talk. You're independent. So, You're able to sort of look after yourself. You're yeah, able to. Absolutely. And, and that's the important thing. Yeah. And just, to, just something which is not medically related, and this is me just making up as I'm going along now, because it's something mm. that's popped into my ADD mind. Mm. 
How's that changed your perspective on things? Just, just as a human being, surviving this, having gone through that, a couple of days to eight weeks. You know, I mean, when you're out there in the material world, the only thing you think about is the comforts of life. Mm. And if you neglect your health, um, there's nothing more important than your own health. Believe me, money is nothing. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so that, that has changed dramatically. I mean, I used to work like a dog yeah. to earn the money. Um, yeah. But mm. at the end of the day, yeah. uh, when they say retrenchment, you get retrenched. Absolutely. Mm. Um, so yeah. that happens. There's no concern about your health in it. Yeah, of course. I mean, we sort of go along, trot along. Never going to happen to me, right? So, this is what a lot of people <laughs> do to think. So, um, on, so Siobhan, if we, if we can come to you. You're putting your hand up there, so I'm just going to give you the floor. Mm. Just in terms of uh, what Ms. Naran has said, it's quite an important concept because a lot of, uh, a lot of our patients, as they, as they go on in life, um, they realize that very important um, realization that, that, you've, that you've just uh, raised there, where, where it's like an insurance po policy. You, you basically invest into this for your entire life and then you try to reap the benefits at the end of the day. And I think your health is a uh, very similar, a similar concept where you can just invest, invest, get, your, get the best out of it, and you can enjoy your retirement years, you know, having, having really lived well. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I mean, patients shouldn't kick themselves in the, in, in the, in the head uh, about that because ultimately we are people, we are, are real people, we, we, we live, we have our lives, mm -hmm. et cetera. Anyway, thanks. Kenneth, do you think I could just make one quick point sure. so that you know, we, we can have sort of a, a thought in the back of our head mm -hmm. when we listen to Siobhan and, and Aman? Yes. Is that we're obviously in the midst of a pandemic, and all common sense has to prevail. Yes. We need to follow the measures that are responsible and have been sort of put forward by sort of the health authorities and government. But I think we also need to be able to assess risk. Absolutely. We need to know that if you have a heart attack, if you have a stroke, which is like a brain attack, there's no point being afraid to come to hospital because the risks of a heart attack and the long-term uh, uh, deleterious effects from the point of view of dying or disability yes. are way worse than the potential effects of COVID. So we need somehow to assess risk. And if you're not sure, rather contact your emergency unit, contact your neurologist or cardiologist and ask what I need to do. And of course, um, life after life, this is Pilates, of course, you've got the paramedic service, which mm. is a free service. I found out about this today, by the way, it was like a bonus for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think I know a lot of things, but I found out it's not an ambulance service, it's a paramedic <laughs> service. 24 hours and wait for this, it's free. It's free. And it works. I've and, had to use it, works. it. Absolutely. And mm. so if you, you pick up, and these are highly trained yeah. paramedics who are yeah. coming out there and can stabilize you until yeah. either metro arrives or private ambulance, yeah. and they then upgrade the ambulance and take you to wherever your destination is, right? I've had to call them and they do work. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so it did work. So that is something to bear in mind and something I think that we should all be thankful for. Mm. So we, we, we'll, we'll talk about when people arrive and, and present with symptoms. But this whole idea that you have to be massive and you have to be overweight before you get a heart attack is a bit of a myth. Mm. And I'll tell you why. I don't say so because I've studied it. A uh, friend of mine, busy running on the treadmill. Fit, as you, I mean, you know, I've got, what, 80% body fat? And he's got, <laughs> and um, pain in his arm on the treadmill the one day. Next day, he goes jogging with his son. Little boy, fit little boy, dad's fit. Running, he collapses. Sure. Mm. So, don't think that you are potentially above a heart attack. We have mm. to have ourselves checked. So, yeah. talk to me about that a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, and, and, and frame it for us. What exactly is a heart attack? Mm. We use that phrase, we use it all mm. the time. Mm. Just a a heart, heart attack in the community is usually used interchangeably with heart failure and a heart attack. But mm. essentially a heart attack is when the artery in, uh, in your heart, one of the main arteries, get, get blocked up. Now mm. there are three major arteries, the one that goes on the right side, the one on the left, and the one going to, around the back of the heart. Yeah. Either one of those um, have multiple branches and, and they, can, they can get blocked. And when I say blocked, I mean um, a clot could form, which yes. actually then re retards the blood flow then it causes what we call ischemia. And that comes with a whole uh, cascade of symptoms, including pain, which we'll discuss yeah. more, more, um, more extensively later on. But in terms of, uh, with respect to a heart attack, it's got a very specific character. Our patients present with central crushing chest discomfort, often radiating to the left arm, uh, maybe radiating to the right arm, or both. And um, diabetics in particular, in case of Mr. Ron, um, you, you, you might not even feel the pain. You might feel a bit of shortness of breath, experience some shortness of breath. 
And often patients um, feel epigastric pain, stomach pain, in the, mm. in the, just at the bottom of the sternum. Yeah. And often get misdiagnosed as gastritis or dyspepsia, yeah. um, often leading to a delay in the diagnosis and presentation, and then presenting in dire straits to the emergency unit. Mm. And um, so the point that you raised about patients who are um, large versus, versus very thin patients, um, we need to talk or think about the risk factor profile. Yeah. And we know that smoking in our society is uh, quite, quite rife. I think there's been a global re reduction yes. in the in incidence of smoking, but I mean, still a very real trend in South Africa. Mm. Um, so amongst uh, smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, hy hypertension, elevated body mass index, those are the, the classical risk factors. Um, not to mention the stress that we face on a daily basis. But if I could mention that smoking and high cholesterol, I mean, those are, those are, are, are potent risk factors and, and often multiplicative in certain patients. Yeah. And then a, a family history, a genetic history is also an extremely potent um, factor and often um, the big supervening factor in patients like you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so, so we've covered the, the heart side of things and because this is what we're talking about. I don't mm. want us to sort of conflate things. Mm. Um, I want to move on to, you know, uh, I'm going to know if we can talk to you about a, a stroke, right? Uh, patients arrive at, at Life Vincent Pilotti um, for possible stroke. You know, one looks at the type of symptoms. But what exactly is a stroke first and foremost? Yeah. Um, you know, how does it differ from everything else that we've spoken about today in layman's terms? Yeah, so, so a stroke is a, a brain attack, firstly. Mm. Mm. Often there's a myth out there that a stroke's got to do with the heart, a stroke has got to do with the brain. Now, there are two types of strokes. One, which is the bleeding type, or what we'd call a hemorrhagic stroke. Yeah. And then the other one is where, like in the heart, an artery gets blocked, and that's called the ischemic, ischemic stroke. Yeah. And that's by far the commonest cause and makes up about 80% uh, of the strokes that we see. Yeah. And the rest, the 20-15% is made up of the hemorrhagic strokes. Yeah. So that's about uh, what a stroke is in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay, and then on the stroke as well, uh, just going to Dr. Ibrahim Kado, who's been rather quiet on the side here. Oh, so I didn't forget point. about you. Uh, you. You heard, uh, you know, Dr. Rawut talking about this ischemic stroke. Hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how you are involved in treating something hmm. like this? Sure. So I like the point you made that no one's immune. It can happen to young, fit, healthy people. Um, and just before lockdown, one of my stroke patients, that Chris Barnard, collapsed in the gym, the Virgin Active Gym. And he was just lucky they brought him straight up to the unit and we were able to oh, sort wow. of open up his blocked artery. Having said that though, as Siobhan said, we can invest in ourselves. So if you do have high blood pressure, your risk of having a stroke is increased by 700%. Mm. If you have diabetes, your risk of stroke is increased by three to 400%. Mm -hmm. So attending to smoking, attending to diabetes, getting a checkup, check your blood pressure, you can actually do something. So, you know, we're not powerless to actually try and sort of control that outcome. So to answer your question directly, so what can we do if you have an ischemic stroke? So the first thing is you need to get to a stroke center. And thankfully at Vincent Pilotti and one other at UCT Private, we have comprehensive stroke center set up. 24 hours, right? 24 hours. Yeah. Why? Because for every minute, for every hour that your brain is starved of oxygen, mm. you lose cells irreversibly. Yeah. So the longer you wait, the more cells you lose. So the quicker we can get you in the better, the same applies to the heart. Mm. Um, and getting to a proper stroke center where you can be diagnosed, treated, and I'll go into treatment in a second, and then rehabilitated as in, in your case, uh, is the best way to achieve a good outcome. Mm. It's where you get the most bang for your buck rather than going to a random hospital. That's the first point. The second point yeah. is from a point what we can do. Um, if, as uh, Amon said, look, most strokes are ischemic, yeah. and you have a clot in the brain, that clot, if it's small, can be dissolved with clot-busting medication. And that can be given in the emergency unit or in the x-ray department. Yes. If the clot is too big, then the clot-busting medication can't get to where it needs to. And in that case, as an interventional neuroradiologist, we then get involved and we can remove that clot from the artery. And that happens in about one in 10 patients with ischemic stroke. They are candidates for that. Okay. But the results can be quite dramatic. Wow. Um, I, I just want to go back to something that you said, Mr. Naran, earlier. You know, we live our lives and we don't worry. And we end up here. What were some of the things that went through your mind while you were, 
in here and, and you got the stroke as well, over and above everything else? Well, I mean, the fact that I used to smoke some years ago in the 90s, <laughs> 80s, mm. quite heavily at that time, 30, yeah. 40 a day. So, um, in fact, they did an x-ray now that they, and the radiologist actually came and said, you can see I smoke a long time ago because there were spots. So that was one of the drawbacks. And then when mm. I became diabetic as well, mm -hmm. uh, because I did not control my weight. And mm. unfortunately, uh, my father passed away in 1975. There was none of these facilities around at that yes. stage. Yes. There was nothing about uh, stents or angiograms or anything like that. So mm. I'm actually fortunate to have the guys like these around. Um, yeah. So yeah, at this hospital, no matter what goes wrong with you, there's always someone that yeah. can cover for the other. Yeah. And they actually talk as a team because I was here three weeks ago. Yeah. And I had three, uh, a physician, a cardiologist, mm -hmm. and a nephrologist, I think he is, um, discuss my case. And yeah. so, Coming here is definitely one of the better things that I've made. Absolutely. And I'm encouraging you, by the way, so what you, you're online, you're listening to us right now, there is an opportunity to type in any questions. If you have any questions, there will be a Q&A time with the panel as well, and we'll give you an opportunity to, to post some of those questions. And don't think a question is stupid. Hey? If you don't know an answer to something, if you're uncertain about something, ask it. Ask it, because I think it's, it's very important. I'm speaking as someone who's a lay person. I know, I've got no cooking clue <laughs> what the doctors have studied and what they actually do. And I don't want to, quite frankly, because uh, as someone who's had a, a blood pressure of 179 over 120 or something like that, mm. uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm on things like Lasartan and Rida. And that's brought my blood pressure right down. Mm. And, and, and one has to manage that sort of thing. We'll get to the meds and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Because yeah. um, there's also the cholesterol side of it. And then people sure. getting a bit of a scrick when you tell them, oh, there's the, what's the other thing that you can take again? A statin or something. Statin, statin yeah. as well. But we'll, we'll, we'll get Very to the med side mm. of it. But let's talk about how you know you're having the symptoms. We talk about breathlessness for heart attack in particular. Mm. So, mm. Dr. Hendricks, if, if you can run through some of those symptoms, some of the things... Mm. How, do, how do we listen to our own bodies sure. to be able to allow us to react mm. in time? So I've touched on a few of those mm. uh, symptoms initially, but uh, let's reiterate some of, some of those yeah, symptoms. Yeah. Now, patients often feel a sense of impending doom with the sort of pain they get. So mm. it's a real severe pain, often the most severe pain that they've felt I mean, mm. I was, I was after childbirth, obviously. Yeah. But uh, in terms of the, the, often patients are diaphoretic, they're sweaty, uh, that's another word for sweaty, they might be nauseous. Some patients complain of, 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 of hypersalivating. Yeah. Uh, the pain has a very typical radiation. Um, often patients feel dizzy. You might even collapse. And if it's a very dramatic presentation, lots of palpitations and followed by collapse, that's mean that, that, that means that you might have had an arrhythmia. Um, so patients then present either via the emergency unit through an ambulance or often pa patients get put into the car and, and get rushed to the emergency unit. So can we talk about the emergency unit component yes, as well? Absolutely. So at the emergency unit, uh, within about 10 minutes, the recommendation is that you should get an ECG with any one, any one of those symptoms. Yeah. And I've mentioned that sometimes stomach-related symptoms, pain in the abdomen, can also be a telltale sign of a heart attack. So the ECG um, via the emergency unit may be very typically uh, in keeping with, uh, with a dramatic ischemic event called an ST elevation myocardial yeah. infarction. And that would require immediate attention um, uh, with, uh, with either with the medication, if you haven't presented to a facility mm. where there are cardiac catheterization facilities. And the recommendation is that if you are, um, if, 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 the, if the chance of, of getting transferred is within, uh, within about two hours, you can then delay the, the, the clot busting medication that we have at our disposal that also used in the setting of stroke. Mm. You can be transferred to, to a PCI center, percutaneous coronary intervention center, for timeous intervention where we actually go in and physically unclog that artery by mechanisms that I could discuss a bit later on. Um, and then that, and that's what would obviously be advantageous. Um, often patients um, present with a bit of pain. The ECG is not that specific, but we have certain bloods at our disposal that we could, uh, blood tests that we could do, one being a troponin eye level. Mm -hmm. And um, often when the troponin eye level is negative, a repeat is done usually within, the, within two to three hours. And when the result is positive, that indicates that there has been some sort of myocardial or cardiac injury that's occurred. 
Mm. And, um, and then, of course, uh, various algorithms take effect, and often patients end up in the cardiac catheterization laboratory uh, for their procedure. So wh when one ends up in the cardiac catheterization laboratory, Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few things that we do. Um, obviously, the patient gets monitored very closely. Uh, we have a host of nurses around who are very, very well trained. And Bishop uh, Bloody Hospital has got an excellent uh, car cardiac catheterization laboratory and, and, and system. Uh, they end up then going to the cath lab, and uh, an intervention takes place either through the radial artery or the femoral artery. Right. Now, the, all arteries eventually lead up to the heart. But uh, uh, very late, the latest techniques are, are done via the radial artery, but obviously the femoral artery being a very... Uh, trial and tested uh, modality of access and um, still an excellent um, means of access. So once the, once the, the, the heart is, 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 um, is sort of is, is defined by, you, by using certain contrast uh, techniques, we can in fact put, put the catheter all the way up the, the artery mm. and direct it towards those very important arteries within the heart called the coronary arteries. We can then define exactly where in, 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 in space that, 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 uh, that, that artery is blocked. And we can locate exactly the position and then um, putting a little wire up the catheter, which is inject, which is into the artery at the time and down that the, the artery. Yeah. Uh, we can then use a balloon to inflate the area of, of blockage. Um, and I'm using the word blockage loosely, yeah. just as in layman's terms. And then subsequently as a stepping stone to a possible stent to be placed in. Now, um, we can discuss the different types of, of, I don't want to be complicated, but I'll use the word revascularization, which means that, uh, you know, opening up arteries and yes. we'll talk about bypasses a bit later on. But um, in the setting of, of an acute heart attack, um, that uh, this intervention could, could, could be life-saving and is life-saving. Because as uh, Ibrahim mentions, I mean, time is muscle. I mean, the heart, with every, every minute that, that goes by, the heart muscle uh, dramatically um, dies in an exponential fashion. So um, if, um, if patients present, this is definitely a modality that could, that could have prognostic effects, uh, could yeah. save the patient's life. And uh, Vince Pilati Hospital has got an excellent PCI facility, we're actually a primary percutaneous coronary intervention facility where uh, if you present here with a heart attack, you will get an angiogram. Um, uh, no doubt about it if you're presenting within a good space of time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think you've got an excellent team looking after you. Absolutely. Now, I mean, you've gone into quite a little, uh, quite a lot of detail there, Dr. Hendricks. So thank you very much for that. We will talk about the bypass. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of people want to know what that actually entails. I also want to get to medication, by the way. Of course. Uh, yeah. When people tell you to take these things, what do they actually do? Why does it work? I mean, when you're taking something, the only thing I know about Rydac hmm. is don't drink tea <laughs> after you've taken your Rydac and you're going on a four-hour trip. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because, yeah, anyway, we won't go down that route yeah. right now. I think let's just talk. But, but let's talk about the stroke, though. We've heard in, in, in quite a lot of detail from Dr. Hendricks, uh, um, you know, his interventions, what happens there. So could you un unpack the same from a stroke's perspective? Yeah, so I think, I think firstly what we, and I also want to get across, and I think we all want to get across, is perhaps the recognition. Yes. And how does one recognize yes. that one is having a stroke? Now, obviously, it depends where the bleed is occurring or where the artery is blocked. It will depend on how the patient might manifest. But without getting that complicated, I think the acronym, acronym that you probably heard um, and that you want to get across to the public out there is the acronym BFAST. And I'll yeah. go through it. B-E-F-A-S-T. Right. So B for balance. So any sudden acute onset of any of these that I'm going to describe yep. is highly likely that you're having a stroke. So be for balance. And you can have imbalance because sudden onset of dizziness mm -hmm. or vertigo, room spinning. You can have imbalance because of incoordination, yep. your legs. Imbalance because of a sudden weak leg, for example. Yeah. And then E for eyes. So sudden blurry vision. Um, sudden loss of vision in one eye mm. or double vision. And then F for face, so get the patient to smile. Mm. And then you can see if there's uh, any asymmetry in the face. But the masks are now, how do we and see And the mask smiling? is a... <laughs> 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 Take the mask off. <laughs> get a see-through mask. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, A for arm. So get the patient to raise the arms. And there might just be a drift, like I'm doing over here. Right. Or the patient can't move the arm at all. Yeah. Inability to lift up that, that arm. S for speech. So is the speech slurred or dysarthric, as we might say? Or is the speech incoherent? The patient right. can't get out 
what they express themselves. Mm -hmm. And then T for time, like Siobhan was saying, time is crucial. Essential. For every minute the brain is deprived of its blood supply, it loses about two million cells. So for every minute. Wow. And so we want to save that. And so the message is early recognition, any one or combination of the signs, acute onset, sudden onset, equals a stroke until proven otherwise, come in immediately because there is treatment there. Absolutely. And I don't want to go down the GP route, but sometimes, you know, when you start feeling exactly what you, the B fast, yeah. it's better to come straight to a facility um, and see, I'm, uh, I'm not knocking GPs because they yeah. play a, a very important yeah. role. I mean, my GP happens to have been a cardiothoracic surgeon, so I'm safe. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> but still, you know, rather, rather see a professional and come I, through because be fast, time, also yeah. very important. Yeah, time is brain. And, and I absolutely agree with you. And with all respect, the GP is a fundamental role. Yeah. And, but come in either, if you can, if the fam uh, family members can bring in the patient themselves immediately yeah that's that's excellent or via paramedics um, and if I may while we're on that that uh, point mm. um, if you if the family member or paramedics are going to bring um, the patients themselves to the hospital yeah um, what's critically important is that someone calls the hospital yes. to say that I'm on my way I'm bringing my dad or whoever to the hospital, speak to the doctor on call over there. Um, they've got the, this history, diabetes, high blood, they've mm. on these medications. So essentially the doctor's taken all the history on the phone already before. Right. So this is pre-hospital mm. notification mm -hmm. before the patient, in fact, uh, comes to the hospital already. Um, all that detail is there. And then generally, that's the best way of doing things. We'd be waiting for the patient at the door and we'll expedite things from there. Once again, time. time. <laughs> be fast, I'll never forget be fast. that. You'll be Not fast, but I will be. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, so lo lots of interesting discussion here, but uh, from your side, Dr. Khan, I mean, how, what would you like to add just from your competencies perspective? Uh, from my competency or lack thereof? <laughs> no. well, <laughs> so, I hope you know, I'm sure so, you're competent. <laughs> what I would like to add, I think, you know, Siobhan and, and Anuman have covered it really well. I think mm -hmm. time is of the essence. You know, yep. So 2 million cells, 2 billion cells sounds like a lot. Mm. But if we can put it into functional terms, I think, come on, you can correct me if I've, I've got the numbers wrong. But for every hour that you delay treatment, yeah. your brain ages by three to four years. Gee. So the sooner the better. Call ahead. Um, we have, we've invested a lot of time, effort and energy and a lot of commitment from a lot of dedicated staff to making sure everything sort of dovetails properly. Yes. You could get to a hospital that has absolutely all the facilities, but if the different cogs in the machine aren't talking to each other, everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of time from when the patient alerts us, gets into their emergency unit. Right. At that point, you might have the clinical suspicion of a stroke, but you don't know whether it's safe to give clot busting medication because if there's a hemorrhage, you'll make it worse. Yeah. But if it's an ischemic stroke, time is of the essence. So the patient needs to get to the radiology department. And that has to dovetail with the emergency. If you wait for half an hour to get to the radiology department for your mm. scan, you've wasted time. Absolutely. So all of that needs to work. Mm -hmm. So call ahead. If you can get to a proper stroke center, uh, it, it, it certainly does help. Just, just um, so, something from a, I'm just putting on my tech hat now, right? The type of information, the critical information you need about patients, whether it's a stroke, whether it's a heart attack, do we have enough systems talking to each other? So even if someone is referred from another hospital mm. group mm. to yours, mm. you already have all that information available. I mean, how, what, what, what happens with this uh, yeah. myriad yeah. of information that sits out there? So I, I think we can do better. Mm. But if I look at, in 2019, we had a similar meeting yeah. at the Artscape. And if I just look at our experience from that meeting to this meeting, yep. just the number of patients that are getting to us earlier, That's good. the rapidity with which we are able to transfer patients, not only within this facility, but from other facilities yep. has improved. So whereas before we might wait three hours for a patient to get from Claremont to here, yep. 
or from one hour for a patient to get from town to here. Yes. We're now looking at 35 minutes. Or instead of seeing a patient at eight or nine hours after their stroke, we are seeing patients at two hours after the stroke. So mm. uh, two months ago, I had a patient in Mitchell's Plain mm -hmm. that arrived at one of our stroke centers within 35 minutes. And they got to Mitchell's Plain within two hours of symptom onset. Mm. And that is as good as any numbers that we are able to match or sort of pull out from anywhere yeah. else in the world. So recognition. I don't think I can mm. stress recognition mm. yeah. more than anything Absolutely. else because that is going to determine what you do next. Mm. Yeah. So even if you can download this, send it on to friends, whatever, refer them to the URL, um, I think it's life-saving to be able to do that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you, you're chatting <clears> to the professionals. And if you've just tuned in, we are... This is part of our Heart and Stroke Dialogue Panel. Um, this is a partnership between Life Health and Brimstone Investment Corporation. And I would like to see more of these things happen more often, to be very honest with you, because it's this type of information that literally can save lives. I want to get on to the, we'll get to the, I've forgotten about the triple bypass. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll also go to questions. I'm, I'm very mindful of the time at the moment. Uh, but for those who've just, tuned in just just to introduce you once again uh, to my right we've got uh, dr shivan hendrickson who is a cardiologist dr uh, manila rawut is a neurologist um, focusing on the stroke side of things and then of course you've just heard dr ibrahim kada who's an interventional radiologist and then the man who got two he came in for a bypass and then they threw in a stroke for free so um <laughs> So, so you've been there and you're living to tell the story and we, we really appreciate the, the, the access to, that we have to your story. But those, please send the questions. I'll go to those. Let's talk medication very quickly. People hear things from other people and they go, oh no, you mustn't take those things. They've got side effects, right? Now I'm sure all medications have side effects. Mm. So let's talk about heart, um, you know, heart conditions. Let me not call it a heart attack or anything else. Mm heart conditions and, and the medication that actually deals with that. So yeah. high blood pressure is, is, is one thing. So mm. I said mm. this, there are lots of other things, the Sartan and Rydic. What, what do those Sartan. do? Mm. So uh, quite, a broad, quite a broad question. Um, mm. If I could just, for the listeners, um, yeah. divide up the cardiac conditions very, in a very cursory That's fashion. That would be a good idea. Heart attacks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's look at it structurally. Uh, yes. We can get problems with the electricity of the heart, uh, problems sure. with the heart muscle, and problems with the coronary artery and obviously uh, problems with the, with the blood vessels and right. you know um, the, the blood vessels are ubiquitous in the body it's everywhere it's in the kidneys the brain so Absolutely. I'm going to use the kidneys as almost like an extension of the cardiac system as well as, as is the brain I mean you can't really separate any of them but uh, let's start with hypertension because you brought it up now Lasartan is a very important um, anti-hypertensive it's a it's a it's a medication that actually works on a specific hormonal system that relates to the kidney and the endocrine system. Right. Now, I think the details are very um, are not, not, not too important, but sure. ultimately, it works on, uh, on a cascade of, 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 of physiological pathways, one of them being the sympathetic nervous system, where it can downregulate the fight and flight response nervous system, if you want to call it. It, 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 it works the on the. Uh, well, in the, in the, at the level of the kidney. <laughs> Listen to uh, me. Sorry. But more importantly, but more in the, <laughs> well, you didn't know something about neurology. That's excellent. And then, of course, uh, but more importantly, uh, it's got to do with salt and water sort mm. of retention. So ultimately, uh, salt uh, gets released and so, so does your water get, get uh, removed from the system as well. Okay. And it's also got, got uh, to do with, the, with, 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 with various other hormones that got to do with vasoconstriction, blood vessel constriction as well. So ultimately, it's got, a, it's got quite, quite far-reaching consequences and it's got good physiological outcomes and good um, outcomes in terms of the trials, okay. I mean, many large center trials. So um, just to look at the target point, the endpoints, your redu reduction of stroke might be a reduction in, in, in cardiovascular endpoints, things like heart attacks, and of course, uh, it can prolong life as well. Um, so if you look at RIDAC, now RIDAC is also a what we call a water pull or a water pull that people call. And ultimately, it causes you to, as you mentioned when, on, your, on your travels, it can make you urinate quite a lot. Mm. So it decreases your intravascular volume and reduces the salt components within your blood and, and, and also um, you know, in, that, in, in that it reduces your blood pressure. Yes. And uh, most patients are on at least one or two agents, sometimes three. And once you start getting onto three or four agents with very difficult to control blood pressure, we call that resistant hypertension. Oh. And uh, that has got a, a very, um, um, you know, a very high risk of, of vascular events, as what my colleagues over here have alluded to mm -hmm. as well, the, the brain. So those are, and there are many more antihypertensives, one of a very common one being calcium channel blockers, like amlodipine, 
um, which, which our listeners might be, might be quite familiar with, that also works at the level of the blood vessels to reduce the constriction. And there are many other, other um, um, t- medications that actually overlap with the treatments of other conditions in the heart, like mm. heart failure. You might find that certain medications used to treat blood pressure might also have certain effects on the muscle of the heart, um, treating heart failure. Mm. So heart failure treatments, um, we would use things like beta blockers, um, Lasix, furosemide, which, which our patients might be, used to, uh, might be familiar with, uh, spiractin, inanoprol, lasartan, yeah. all of those things could also treat it. Um, when one talks specifically about coronary artery disease, blockages in the artery, and when I mean blockages, I mean buildup of atherosclerosis, yeah. where patients develop an acute blockage and a thrombosis in the, in the coronary arteries. You know, yeah. and when we talk about a blockage, it's a buildup of this inflammatory material, lipids, it's got to do with, uh, with, with, with hard calcium um, you know, material that builds up. Yeah. Um, and and you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of them must be, must, must be familiar with, with aspirin, disprin, which actually thins the blood, yes. we call it. And it actually has an impact on the platelets, which also have a very instrumental role in, in, in ischemic stroke, as what my, my, my honorable colleague said. Um, and then, of course, um, aspirin is important. And you've raised the point about the statin, which um, when one uh, in the primary, using, using statins in the secondary sense, where you actually have had an ischemic event as proven benefit that um, you are going to reduce further events. And um, we've actually seen that, you know, modifying your lipid profile to certain points, such as an LDL of less to less than 1.8 when you've had a, a heart attack, is obviously got, uh, got, got mm. really, very beneficial effects for you. So statin, when I, we talk about statins, and we'll use some examples here, simvastatin, atorvastatin, resuvastatin being some of the important ones. So once you get vascular disease, peripheral vascular right. disease, cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, those two medications, uh, disprin and statin, are sort of almost uh, you know, part of the armamentarium of treatment and should be the mainstay. And patients should be extremely compliant on those medications. I think you mentioned something about medications um, that patients are you know, mentioned as being highly toxic. And mm. we talk about warfarin here, um, particularly in the setting of stroke and the atrial fibrillation. So warfarin, um, you know, patients often tell me, no, that's rat poison. It's, it's not, you know, I don't, I don't want to use that. I'm sure you must have heard that before. Oh, yes, you try to keep the, the conversation yeah. colloquial. Yeah. Um, so, the, you know, warfarin in under cir- certain circumstances, and we use very advanced scoring uh, mechanisms that have been uh, trial and tested. And patients have good indications for warfarin, particularly in the setting of atrial fibrillation to prevent ischemic stroke. And um, that should be emphasized by the health care practitioners as, 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 as extremely important. And there are obviously novel oral anticoagulants that are also at our disposal at the moment that we can also use. But I leave that for another discussion. Maybe yeah. perhaps my colleagues want to talk about that. And also, okay. just, just one thing, with, with these tablets, you take them once a day. It's mm. not as if in the past you used to take a couple of tablets. Now you're mm. just taking two in the morning. Mm. Um, if, if, if we're talking about the, the, yeah. the, the Lasartans and the, and, and the Rydax, mm. and even the Statins. Right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, Manila, f- from your side. Look, in terms of medication, and perhaps I also want to focus on, on stroke treatment medication. Yes. And what's crucial is what we're trying to get across here is the early PFAST. So that early time period within, and everyone speaks about the four and a half hour cut of period. So if one ever stroke, come in immediately because there's intervention that can be done within that time period. So we've spoken about clot busters. So if a patient, when a patient comes in within that time, lytic, what we call a lytic window, um, there are certain clot busters we can give. So if the patient ticks all the boxes, so there are no contraindications to giving that medication. So we've done the scan, we excluded a bleed, um, excluded other th- things that might mimic a stroke, yeah. tumors, etc. And they've ticked all the other boxes, no contraindication, no other bleeding risks, um, peptic ulcers, recent surgery. Yeah. Then we'll go ahead and we'll give that uh, medication um, intravenously, yeah. which is essentially a clot buster. And we've seen some dramatic results Mm. Um, literally with that yeah. and, and when we do the CT scan and we see a, there's a stroke yeah. or early features of a stroke we go further than that and we do a um, looking at the imaging and that's where uh, Dr. Kader will be yeah. com- commenting on the vascular imaging to mm. see if there's any what we call large vessel occlusion okay and if the clot buster or the blood thinning medication doesn't break up that clot then that's where Dr. Kader will come in and try and uh, remove that clot there. Yeah. Dr. Kader. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to touch on one point that you made yeah. about side effects. Mm. 
So I think it's human nature to attach less weight or significance to um, a benefit that might be deferred or delayed yeah. or might happen later on. Yes. And attach more significance to something happening right now. So Correct. if I take this medication, I feel my legs are sore or this happens to me. And we weigh that more heavily than the potential long-term benefit of not having a stroke. Yes. And I think we need to be aware of that. Yes. Rather take your medication, discuss any side effects that are affecting you because the risks of not taking your medication are far higher. Yeah, no, indeed. So I think that's an important point. Then from the point of view of Amon says, obviously uh, imaging is important in assisting or deciding how to treat. Yes. If a small artery is occluded, a clot busting medication, which is sort of in the same class as um, a drug derived from bat saliva, mm -hmm. is used to dissolve the clot. Um, if a larger artery is occluded, you could yeah. sort of imagine having a chunk of clot that you just can't get a big enough bite off with a clot bust busting medication. In a case like that, we would then use a similar approach to a cardiologist going either via the radial artery or the femoral artery, any way to get access to the inside of the vessel. And we then track various catheters up to the blockage right. and use various strategies to either sort of suck the clot out or use a stent right. to open the clot or open the artery, any, as, as Amar, uh, Siobhan said, to revascularize the brain. Because what you want to do is any bit of brain downstream from the clot is deprived of oxygen and you're losing cells. So the quicker you can get the clot out and get blood flowing again, um, the better. As you said, after every hour, a couple of years lost. A couple of years, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very important point. For those who've just tuned in, <laughs> but later, but anyway, <laughs> um, having a, a wonderful chat here. I'm certainly very informed by this. We've got some questions. So one of the questions that uh, popped up here is, would taking a blood thinner prevent the occurrence of a stroke, even if you have no underlying conditions or symptoms? <laughs> Great okay, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Look, so recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, probably about a year or two ago, that question was actually answered. So if I don't have any risk factors, historically, in fact, we used to almost immediately give disprin um, as a preventative. Yeah. But I think that doesn't sort of play a role anymore. Unless you've got risk factors, yeah. i.e. diabetes, hypertension, you're a smoker, cholesterol, um, and you've had some sort of event, then yes, a preventative like uh, uh, discipline uh, would be of importance. But in the absence of all those risk factors and no events, then probably the risk of bleeding mm. would outweigh the benefit of it. Mm. So probably not. And that is particularly a good question. And then another one. Uh, what are the common side effects of statins? Good question. Hmm. Common side effects of statins would be muscle cramps. Uh, patients often uh, complain of joint pains even. Um, very dramatic side effect of statins would be um, the breakdown of the muscle, which is a very rare side effect. Yeah. Uh, also another dramatic side effect would be uh, liver inflammation and um, what we call hepatitis. I've seen a few cases of that, but uh, also a very rare side effect. If one looks at the overall benefit of a statin, one always have to wear, wear up with the risks. And as what Ibrahim says, it's always yep. a risk-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so in patients with, with very high cholesterol or diabetic, and I've got a low threshold for using statin in diabetic, um, it, it's certainly an, an excellent medication to use. Of, of course, if some, in somebody with, who's had an established myocardial infarct or has significant vascular disease, I think a statin would be key in the treatment of these patients. So, so certainly muscle cramps, and they are... Um, so that, that's why statins are taken at night, uh, to prevent the sensation of these pains. Patients are often sleeping, they're resting, they're not utilizing their muscles, gets into the system. Um, there are certain supplements that one can take, often uh, supplementation with magnesium uh, yes. might have, a, have some, some effect. Uh, there are no clinical trials on that. There are some other enzymes that one can take, but I mean, no real right. big clinical trials. Now listen, we're over 40, eh? I'm 46. <laughs> so I don't worry about the pains. I sit down I'm normally for... Take it. <laughs> <laughs> I stand up, I've got pain. So if that's a side effect, no problem if, whatsoever. If, if you make a noise when you get up or sit down, you should be taking some medication for something. <laughs> what? No. Are you serious? If, 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 if there are sound effects when you get up or sit down, then you shouldn't oh, worry about side effects. effects. <laughs> 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 then 
What is the, what's the success rate? Another question, by the way. Thanks for sending these through. Uh, what's the success rate when it comes to reversing a stroke? Who's going to take that one? Um, let, you, uh, do you want to start with a small vessel, then I can do a large yeah. vessel? Look, so when we, when we give the IV thrombolysis or the clot busting medication, not every patient is going to be a, suc a successful revascularization or, yeah, so the success rate is probably, I think around about 30, 40%. Mm. Yeah. Um, but where you see, and you can see a dramatic response when you do see that response. Um, but where Dr. Kader will come in is mm. that his response can be very dramatic. Right. Once yeah. that clot gets removed physically, um, it's magic. Yeah, it's a really Lazarus mm. treatment. Mm. So yeah. I think, uh, you know, with, with any treatment, there's a concept called number needed to treat. Mm. And without getting too technical, I'm, I'm going to try and simplify it is how many patients do I need to treat, let's say, to save one life? And I'm, I'm simplifying. But how many, and, and you can judge any treatment that we can offer in medicine, whether it's a tablet like aspirin, a headache tablet like Bernardo, an operation like treatment for an aortic aneurysm, any treatment. Mm -hmm. How many patients do I need to treat to save a life or to have a positive effect? So for cardiology overall, um, I think that's sitting in like, you need to treat 27 patients to save a life. For acute cardiology, you need to treat fewer patients. Mm -hmm. Currently, taking a clot out of a blocked artery in a brain, you need to treat two and a half patients to save one life. So it's one of the most effective treatments we have available. Your number needed to treat is 2.7. So what I would like people to take home is that rather than this nihilistic stroke, uh, approach we used to have to stroke mm -hmm. is, well, you've got a stroke, you're paralyzed, you can't talk, you need to be rehabilitated. Yeah. That's not the approach. Be active, get to a unit quickly, because we've had patients that have been completely paralyzed, unable to speak, and the patient said to me, Doc, can you stop what you're doing? I have a headache. I said, well, that's a good sign. Do you realize that half an hour ago when we started, you weren't able to talk? And that patient would then get mm. up off the table. Or if I could just relate, relate a story. Um, last year, a year, a year before last, I got a call from Chris Barnard. I've got an 87-year-old patient. And already you think, well, the patient's quite old. What are the risks of doing the procedure? Is my potential benefit or good that I can do limited? Yeah. The casualty officer said to me, before you go on, let me tell you there's a backstory. I said, well, what's going on? He says, a year ago, you treated his wife to the day. And she was paralyzed. She survived. And a year later, yeah. she's brought him in with a stroke. Phenomenal. She well, brought him in. And I said, fine, I'm coming in to do it. And we revascularized, we opened the block artery. And I said to the family, look, the brain's old. It's been without oxygen for six hours. Let's be cautious in our approach. Don't expect miracles. Let's give it four or five days. And the next morning I got into ICU and the patient's bed was empty and my heart sank. And I thought, oh, somebody would have told me something happened overnight. And as I looked up, he came walking around the corner at 87. So... We, yeah. You can make a difference if you get to the right center. I want to go, okay, we, we've done the recognition, we've done a whole lot of this other stuff, but according, you know, contrary to popular belief, you guys are actually human. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when you have a patient um, there, sometimes people say, our oh, doctors can be very cold. But let's talk about the human aspect of being a doctor and treating a patient. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think it's always important to deal with that. We can talk about all the other great things we spoke mm -hmm. about, but at the end of the day, you need to realize when you're lying there yeah. and you're wondering whether or not you're going to see family members, mm -hmm. you want to be surrounded by people who are compassionate, people who show that they care, and you are not just patient number 345, mm -hmm. right, who got the double whammy. So let's talk about this from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, yeah. let, let's start. Let's start with that. We'll work our way up. Mm -hmm. Just get me here. It's fine. I think in the interest of time, I'm going yeah. to keep this brief and probably yeah. what I, just to, 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 to sum up, my, uh, or our approach would be is treat everyone like you would treat your own parents or your own mm. family member. Yeah. Mm. And, and that's where the compassion will come out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's so important. Mm. I think often, often we, get, we get carried away with the, with the drama of the whole presentation and uh, we focus on the, on the, you know, the bio, biological, but 
ultimately there's a huge family at, in the background. There's a, there are, there's, a, there's a mother or father at home um, wondering what's going on, especially particularly in the COVID epidemic where patients, uh, were, where families weren't allowed to, 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 yeah. to accompany mm. the, uh, the relatives. So I think picking up the phone, discussing at every, every level of the, of the care or what, what, what's transpiring, how the operation went. Um, and then, of course, in, incorporating the, the concept that, you know, the patient, this is a patient is anxious, they're scared, they've just been through something. They obviously experiencing all of this at a very, very psychological level. And to go back and actually just discuss with them very carefully as to what happened. And then I think um, just to allow them uh, allow time for, for, the, for this whole, the whole incident to sink in. But I think the family mm -hmm. contact was, for me is the, is the take home message. I find that mm -hmm. that often um, doesn't matter how complex your procedure, how complicated your procedure, often families are appreciated greatly if you make contact. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a balance. Um, at some point, you're going to want the doctor who is focused and wants to get the job done. But at the end of that, you need somebody to then connect with the fact that at the end of my catheter, there's a human being and they've got family outside that's anxious. Because what I always say is, would you like someone that's going to save your life or someone that's just going to hold your hand and watch you die? So there's a balance that you need to achieve. At some point, you focus and you get the job done. And one thing that's stuck with me for the last four years of doing this yeah. is one night about just after midnight, I was, or before midnight, we were just getting home, my boy and I, and I got called out to Pilotti to come and treat a stroke. And I brought him along with me because there was no babysitter and he was sitting in theater sort of watching the whole procedure. We finished the case, took the patient to ICU and we're driving home in silence. And halfway home, he said to me, dad, can I tell you something? And I said, what happened? He said, while you were in ICU, the patient's daughter, who was probably in her teens, and he was probably about six or seven at the time, said to him, thank you for letting your dad come and help my dad. Wow. And that has stuck with him, I know, for the last four or five years, and it certainly has stuck with me. Wow. So, and and uh, I'm, I'm so happy I asked that question, because we have to bring the human side in. But there was, I want to, people have been sending a lot of questions, and I want to, final one, we literally have about three and a half minutes left. Mm. Would you recommend the taking of heart support enzymes? Cardiac support enzymes. Mm. Mm. Now, what what is that? What is that? Uh, the question is, what does that mean? I, have, yes. I haven't actually. Uh, I don't think that is a that is a, a commonly used term. I'm, mm. I'm, are they talking about coenzyme Q10, which is a, which is a commonly used enzyme or medication yeah. used with a statin? Yeah. But. Um, Heart support enzymes. Um, I must you, be honest, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I can, or I can, we could talk about nutritional supplementation. Um, you know, when patients have an alcohol based uh, cardiomyopathy or problems related to the heart due to that, um, often thymine, which is a, which is a, which is a, you know, supplement could be used to, to augment the, the cardiac strength, etc. But um, I think it's a very, um, I don't think it's a it's a, it's a trial and tested uh, yeah. you know treatment that I've uh, that is part of the doc part of the, part of the research and that sort of thing. So I would just stick with our with our usual biochemistry. But uh, but ultimately um, there are lots of homeopathic remedies out there and lots of other fad products out there that patients should also be highly aware mm. of uh, being punted as uh, miracle cardiac mm. cures and miracle medications. And I can extend this to the COVID epidemic, HIV, etc. So. Um, you know, this sort of question maybe highlights that important point that in ending off, maybe it was a prudent point to, to, to touch so. on. So I think, uh, thanks for that question. Absolutely. So I'm literally left with a minute and a half. I just want to thank you, you Dr. Sean Hendricks. Of course, pleasure. Dr. Manula, thank you pleasure. very much. And Dr. Ibrahim Kada, you guys have, have really contributed tremendously. But I think most importantly, I want you to have the last say. Our survivor, right? So... Talk to me, Mr. Naran, a message to anybody listening to us tonight. The first thing is, if you're feeling those pains, I would say take a half a discipline or even a whole discipline and go and see a hospital or wherever. Because a friend of mine had pains across his chest and no one told him anything. He fell down in his bathroom and died there. Yeah. So one of the key things I think that you can do is help yourself by just taking the discipline. Even if you've got palpitations in your stomach, it doesn't matter. It's not going to harm that. It's an anticoagulant. Antiplated agent. Anti -plated. Anti -plated. Yes. That's why I didn't study medicine. I want to thank everybody <laughs> for joining us tonight. Once again, this brought to you by Brimstone Investment Corporation, Plus Life Healthcare, and just the advanced life support paramedics 
take advantage of them. Next week, we're going to be talking mental well-being. Do you have a contact number for those paramedics? We'll oh, get we'll the, to. Okay. Who's got the contact number? Okay. Okay, it'll be on the screen. So check it out, write it down, and I promise you they are phenomenal and they will save your life. They could very well save your life or a family member's life. Next week, mental well-being, just as important. And I look forward to being here next week and once again running through some really key things that we should recognize. Recognition is something I've learned here tonight in terms of the big messaging, you know. When people have mental health issues and challenges, we as family members need to be able to recognize that. Very mm -hmm. important. But that is when we see you next week. And thank you very much for joining us.